Hello, welcome to the Better Outcomes Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Each episode, we bring you a conversation with leaders across the healthcare industry, exploring topics ranging from new treatment techniques and interventions to novel service delivery methods and business models. And now your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions, a leader in patient engagement and retention strategy. Let's explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Well, hello again. Welcome to another episode of the Better Outcomes Show. I'm your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions. Wow, this week we are taking a break from tech and all the techie things going on, taking a break from how do we save healthcare. I did get a few emails from that episode, and it looks like I'm going to try to get something together, maybe maybe some kind of panel discussion or something with some different folks about ways that clinicians can begin to monetize their knowledge and their skills in a way outside of traditional in-person, in-clinic treatment. So um, more to follow on that is one of my (laughs) former colleagues used to always say. Anyways, this week... I am talking with Trish Williams, who is a fellow occupational therapist. She's from Canada, and she runs Trish Williams Consulting. She helps a bunch of entrepreneurs really build businesses that suit their lifestyle. Uh, We connected a few years ago. They were putting on a conference. I think it was called like Mind Your Own Business or Mind Your Own OT Business or something like that. And I gave a a presentation about uh, patient engagement and retention, and that's how we that's how we connected. So we've we've stayed in touch since then. And Trish has done a lot of work with folks on the importance of mission, vision, values, and how all of that comes together, both in the decisions you're making within your organization, within the business, the strategic decisions about what you do and don't get involved in, but then also how it impacts long term profitability. So, uh, we have a a bit of a wide-ranging discussion. She used to own a brick-and-mortar pediatric uh, occupational therapy clinic in Canada, and she ended up going through a transition and selling that business. So, we talked a little bit about how that sale came about, (laughs) how it was sort of like a ad hoc, thrown-together deal but it was based in relationships and it was a win-win and it fit with her her mission vision and values so we talk a little bit about that and how it was maybe not a quote-unquote traditional uh exit or traditional uh, acquisition deal but it worked out for both parties and then we we talk a lot about the importance of defining your what is what is the mission what is the vision and how do the values play into that. So hopefully, if you are in a position of leadership in a healthcare organization, maybe you run an independent uh, healthcare practice, or maybe you're just a departmental head, um, an administrator or something like that, and you are kind of taking a look at culture at your organization, reaching and achieving strategic objectives, and trying to figure out how, how does this whole, how do we connect the dots from this very almost abstract idea of the the higher purpose or the vision of an organization and how do we how do we take that and make actual practical strategic decisions operational decisions even based off of those mission vision and the values so without further ado um, here is Trish Williams talking with me about uh, mission vision values and the role that they play in business success in healthcare practices well, hey, Trish, welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, Rafi. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you on. I want to talk about um, company values and missions and how that works into profitability. But before we do that, just give us a brief rundown. Who is Trish Williams? What got you into doing what you're doing now? And, and then we'll kind of go from there. Fantastic. Trish Williams identifies as a Canadian. I identify, <laughs> I, I lead with that. I identify, yes. if my accent isn't the biggest giveaway. I identify as a parent, uh, asterisk, 
just a few weeks ago, I became an empty nester. My oh, youngest wow. went away to university. Uh, I identify as a female. I identify as a an occupational therapist. And I used to have a bricks and mortar company here in Calgary, Alberta, where I live, a pediatric facility, which I lovingly grew from Zippo Zero, <laughs> me in a rented room, to eventually having a staff and grossing you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what I started to realize was that people were reaching out to us, not just for our services, but OTs across the world, actually. The first one was from Kentucky and the second one was from Ireland saying, yeah. hey, how have you done this? Um, and then I saw that as a great switch to what I do now, which is I coach OT entrepreneurs who identify as female to start, grow and scale their businesses. And I was very happy with that approach because it felt like a nice, I, I'm, I'm always up for a challenge. Yeah. And I also loved it as, um, how can I say this? Almost like a, a healthy aging thing for me, if that doesn't sound ridiculous, but I'm 52. <laughs> like it's it was time in a way to get off the floor and yeah. playing with kids and, and, you know, having something mobile, which this business is, and alluding back to having my children out of the house as a single person, I can make some really interesting choices right now for myself. So it all kind of worked, knock on wood. That yeah, was the all, plan. The, all the pieces fell into place. Yeah, it kind of I remember did. when you made the decision to like close your brick and mortar yeah. uh, clinic and people were like, oh my gosh, how's this going to work out? And I was kind of like sitting in the background watching because it was yep. something exciting to see. But at the same yep. time, I'm sure it was puckered you up a little bit, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really did. And you know, what's very interesting is that I wound up selling it. So I wound up making the decision to close it first and actually wound up selling basically a closed clinic, which is like, how does that ever happen? Yeah. Um, how it happened very briefly is a friend, a colleague of mine, local reached out to say, hey, I'd like to partake in your OT services. Can you help me start a business? And I realized I could probably sell her the clinic. So we talked about what are the assets in that clinic? It was you know, my policies and procedures, my systems, yeah. my marketing, um, you know, the logo and the brand and the client list, et cetera. So it's been an interesting journey. Yeah. So y'all, did you do like an asset sale for the, for the clinic itself? And I mean, we're going to take a little rabbit hole here. Did you, yeah, how yeah. did the valuation work? Because it was closed, right? Yes. We so it wasn't generating it. any revenue when you sold it. Correct pretty interesting, eh? Yeah. Um, and I had sold, I had, you know, left the building, the building wasn't mine, I was renting and I had sold off most of the hard goods, like the toys, et cetera, and the assessments, et cetera. Uh, you know, it was a private sale and yeah. we decided together not to get into a whole bunch of lawyers making a whole bunch of valuation. And I'm okay with that because I knew this person, we were really very respectful of each other's work. It felt like the right person. I mean, Rafi, I was actually standing in the shower thinking about my meeting with her coming up as like, you know, the OT entrepreneur coach consultant. And all of a sudden I went, wait a second, why doesn't she buy spring OT? Like there was nothing more than that spark. And again, with really, in my opinion, a great sales is a conversation. So we just yeah. continued the conversation and we knew each other really well. So did I, could I have gotten more money out of it? Of course I could have, but I didn't, that wasn't really the main motivation at that point. The motivation was like, let's just keep this easy and smooth and bring in lawyers when we need to. They left with an asset. They were like, you know, a company, they were thrilled and she made a hundred grand right out, right out the gate. Right. Yeah. Cause everything was tickety boo. Ready to go. Yeah. So, and I left with change that chunk of change that I didn't have beforehand. <laughs> so it was. Maybe it's a very Canadian way of doing business. I'm not sure. Uh, or, a, you know, a female way of doing business. But it was really, you know, talk about v values and mission about what we're going to talk about. It felt really good for my values to have a conversation with a friend, hand her something and walk away with some yeah. money for it. And it was a win-win for both of you all, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then let's talk a little bit then about company values and mission and all that. I think a lot of times, you and I are both in the consulting, the consulting world, and we're, we hear these words a lot. And sometimes they're very like pie in the sky. And how do you take this and make it something practical? Kind of what's your view on what should be or, or, or how do you develop uh, the values and the mission of a company? And then let's take it practical from there instead of making it this pie in the sky thing where we're going to 
you know, make the world a better place (laughs) (laughs) to actual, you know, business processes and procedures and, you know, how you treat employees and all of that. Yes. So your question then is how do you, yeah, where do you start? How do you get this vision? How do you get these core values? Well, I started by consuming a whack ton of information on this very topic. I had hit a plateau in my business, bricks and mortar, in about 2017, 2018, and I realized that I was the bottleneck and we needed to grow. We couldn't, I couldn't seem to hit, you know, a ceiling above 300,000 and gross. And I did so much work to learn how to grow a business because nobody taught me. I had started this thing on the fly. I was growing this thing on the fly. Business books didn't resonate with me. So I decided to open all of them (laughs) and read them all. And for that, I developed a process with prompts and actually, you know, small plug, I now do this. I teach people how to build strategic plans, but that's really where I started. I didn't even need a, a plan for the bank. Yeah. Because I didn't go and get money from the bank until way later. So I never needed to come to get a loan to start the business with like a business plan. So I was making the strategic plan when we were like way in the growth phase, right? And it was the beginning of building a strategic plan where I learned how to set the mission and how to set the vision and how to set core values. So I'll give you a small definition on that. Sure. Um, the core values... The, the, the vision, and you know what, it's really interesting, Rafi, because I use vision and mission interchangeably. And we may choose to do that in this podcast, but they're actually different. Yeah, and exactly. I don't want, okay, you're with me? Yes. I, okay, I'm what's tracking. your definition then? Okay, do you want to so, do you want to tell me what you, what you think? Yeah, yeah. So the, at least the way we do it in our clinic, and even with Rehab U, is like, the vision is the long-term ideal, right? And then the mission is, what's the strategic implication of that, of that vision? Exactly. And then the core values are the, you know, it sets the agenda and guides the behavior. Now, I often mix mission and vision, and I actually see it in a lot of writing as well, in a lot of the things that I consumed. So if people are listening to this, we're not splitting hairs. (laughs) We want you to like get something out of this that isn't like, I don't remember what Rafi and Trish said the difference between vision and mission is. It's to come away with something that's bigger than yourself. So that's how I did it. I just consumed a whack ton of material and then developed prompts that really set those for both companies, for my bricks and mortar and for Trish Williams Consulting. Yeah. And you were, so you were doing the, the, the bricks and mortar for a while, then you started the consulting. Yeah. Do your, did your vision or mission or values, whatever, did they overlap in the two and one kind of naturally led you into the, into the Trish Williams consulting, or did you have to take Mm. some time and say, what is going to be different about this business, this new endeavor, that's going to be different than the bricks and mortar. That's going to lead me. Like maybe we need to develop a new vision statement or, or mission or something. That is such a fantastic question. And I have never, ever (laughs) thought about that. Here's my answer. It was number two. So I, think that the core values would be the same because the values yeah. are kind of about me. Um, and the vision and the mission are significantly different for Trish Williams Consulting. I'll be honest, I struggled with a bigger, badder vision and mission for my bricks and mortar spring OT because I felt at the end of the day if I'm being really honest, we were doing a lot of the same therapy and treatment that a lot of other people were doing, although we didn't have a huge market here in Calgary. Um, I mean, we had some differentiation based on my training with, you know, sensory processing that kind of blew the lid off of everybody. There were still a lot of people doing like traditional gross and fine motor or social skills. And we leaned, we lent, leaned, lent, <laughs> leaned into <Lended>. that, <laughs> lent it, like leaned into that. And yet I'm not sure I did a great job as a CEO to really lead with that all the time with my clients and with my team. Whereas I got really serious about it with Trish Williams Consulting. Yeah. Cool deal. Um, so then... 
you talked about developing it. So you've got your, your let's say you come up with your, your mission and your vision, and you're saying those stem from, and I, I agree with this here, they stem from those values mm -hmm. and those values, where do they come from? You reading them out of a book? Are they coming from no. you know, deep down inside? Like Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to open up the website that I have now and we'll talk a few. A th I can give you a few examples. So, sure, yeah. Um, we walk alongside is one of our values. We're not above everyone else. We're figuring it out and together we grow and take risks and learn. And that is quite literally me. Um, I'm super growth mindset. In fact, it's one of my cardinal words. I used to say it's growth. And then somebody suggested to me a couple months ago that it was actually expansion. And that's really the core world word of why I show up in the world every day. Like if I have done any sort of expansion in my day, my day feels great. Um, another one is we are more than a business. We're a movement. Our community stands together together to better the lives of others. And I've always been very independent and very collaborative. So again, that's just me. Uh, another one is our future vision drives change for you today, meaning we leave the profession better than we found it. And Rafi, I know you share that with me. Yeah. <laughs> you and I have been on university faculties. I have sat on a ton of focus groups for the college. <laughs> you know, even as a student, I was at McMaster University, which is one of the pioneering universities for problem-based learning, increased seminar, et cetera. So that's always well, been one for point. OTs. It's like everybody, everybody in OT school hears about McMaster. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yay. Um, and I actually wound up teaching there too. That was my first faculty job after I had graduated 10 years before. But I will say. The values required collaboration to pull those words out. I am a chatty Cathy. I can be a wordsmith at times. I did use a lot of prompts to get those out, but in, to get those perfect words for a website, I actually worked with a copywriter with Jenny Gill who really helped me. Oh yeah. Shout out to her. She's a, she's another OT in the space. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who has now become a copywriter. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, so these, these values, mm -hmm. they're obviously their core, they're your personality, especially mm -hmm. in small businesses like ours. Mm -hmm. I always say like at some point, the, the values, what's driving the business is, is the CEO or the, the owner, whoever, whatever title you want to put. And it's kind of their, their personal values that's kind of getting imposed on the business and that kind of leads into the 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 systems that are created or the mission that's developed or that grows out of that right so how you took the those values you developed them and then how does that translate into mission vision well i i realized that especially being a leader in the space there there you know when you and i started there was there were not many people in this space doing what we do yeah even a couple of years ago. And I think that encouraged me and probably a certain amount of confidence in having grown a brick and mortar to actually set a pretty big vision and agenda. And so again, when I, and I kept thinking, what else, what else, what else? And it took a lot of thought and where I wound up landing was that my mission here is to empower OTs who identify as female to claim their financial freedom by growing and scaling their businesses. And the, the vision for that, pardon me, the mission for that is that I personally believe and know from the statistics that what women or people who identify as women do with their money is different than men. Yeah. And we use it to better our team, to better our family, to better our community. And I understand that that's really about impact. So even though the company and the brand, the, the brand is called OTs Get Paid, it's more than that. It's about getting women paid for impact. And all the conversations I've had with all of the OTs that are entrepreneurs, that's really what they want. And I, I think you're the same, right, Rafi? Like, I don't think you started this just for the money. Like, you have five kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, first of all, you That's need true. the money. <laughs> exactly. And second of all, I mean, I know 
I'm guessing, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, inferring maybe because I know you, that there's more at play here for you than the money. It's the impact that you want your business to make. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mm -hmm. think that that's absolutely true. It, probably because our 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 values align in, in some level. But yeah, I, I think that um, there's more to life than money, although you need money. But the reality mm -hmm. is I'm a big fan of, and I use this in the book here, the, the story, The Alchemist. Have you read it, Paolo Coelho? I sure have. That last story where he talks about... Um, the 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 boy going to see the the wise man and he gives him the the drops of oil in his spoon and he spills it and he you know when he's looking at everything and the wise man looks at him and says well the secret to fulfillment in life is to soak in all the wonders of the world um but never forget about the drops of oil in the spoon and for me that's that's the the people right it's mm -hmm. it's all about impacting individual lives that's why the book is about you know, humanizing healthcare, building relationships. And then it's the mm -hmm. same with the consulting work that I do too, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've got clients that I haven't worked with in years and we still, you know, chat all the time because there's a relationship there. So. Exactly. I would like to say one more thing. And that is from a practical perspective, women often don't have money conversations and we are a helping business, which is primarily female based. And I wanted to bring that human element to leaning into those conversations. And it is similar to like your big vision, which is humanizing healthcare, saying, I'm going to lean into money conversations. I'm going to help women break free, break through those societal limitations, in, especially for helping professions, it, it gets a heck yes from a lot of people. Yeah. And it also gets a no from others, right? So I, I want to point out that if people are thinking about their mission as they're listening to this, don't hesitate to tick some people off. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big believer in that. Like a, a, a mission or a vision that is worth standing for is going to, at some level, be very appealing to some, and then it's going to be oppositional to others, right? Like yeah. you can't, you can't make everybody happy. <laughs> yeah, and nor should you. Yeah. I mean, you want your people, you want your heck yes people. Yeah. Let's circle back. Cause you said something that was very interesting. And I do think maybe it's a, it's a woman thing or a female thing in, in, in general, but I do think it it bears greater discussion in healthcare. You said that people don't like talking about money in service-based organizations, maybe because they're female. I have a feeling like it's bigger than that. Like you talk about wanting to be profitable in healthcare and, <laughs> and people nut up. Like, why do you think that is? Oh, I have a podcast planned about this, actually. It's oh, only okay. an outline. It's only an outline. So maybe you're helping me figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I read something somewhere in, a, in a, a woman I know who does negotiation for a living. And she has a theme in her negotiations called the Mother Teresa complex uh, and how it's difficult, I think, for people to negotiate if they identify as this Mother Teresa complex. And I feel that there's a incorrect assumption out there that in order to be a good person which is what most of us went into yeah. healthcare with that vision right like i used yeah. to tell people actually it's funny because we charged a lot of money at spring ot and i remember parents because it was peds would look at me often and they'd kind of get grumpy in my face and say like oh this is a lot of money particularly you know the male identifying person and i would say to them like you know i'm driving a 10 year old honda like <laughs> I'm not here yeah. to like buy a Porsche. There's like, not a Maserati in the bay. That's in the, right. In the I would like lot, to right? send my children to university <laughs> with the money you're going to give me. I'll just be straight up about that. But it was almost as though those people were ticked off at me for charging what I was charging. Well, and especially in Canada where we have socialized medicine. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's story. in and of itself. Yeah, yeah a different um, story. You know, how dare you when you're supposed to be a helper? And I'm an Enneagram too, so I know about helper. Like that's who I am. I'm also an Enneagram three, which is like, go, go, do, 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 you know, achieve, achieve, achieve. So my guilt complex is gone because when I actually read the Enneagram and I was like, darn, that's exactly me. Helper, helper, do, do. I was like, well, 
of course I'm going to be a healthcare provider that's going to push the buttons. So I think, and I saw that a lot in my team, like when I started to embrace more, well, at the bricks and mortar raising our prices and my clinic manager leaning into sales and teaching her how to have sales conversations rather than me on the phone all the time. That was really hard. She balked. She was like, I know you're worth it, but what about the children? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that there's, I, I definitely see that Mother Teresa complex. And I think it, it stems from this idea that at least, you know, we're, we're probably somewhat different market wise in the US and, and Canada, but it's mm -hmm. still the ba same basic principle, yep. like healthcare is a service, you're helping people who mm -hmm. are, you know, sick or, or wounded. And there's this, this, this idea that by charging a lot of money, you're taking advantage of somebody exactly. who has no other options, right? Like this person is sick, and you provide the treatment, and you're taking advantage by charging a lot. And um, so there's that aspect. And then the whole aspect of, you know, we've all been in like, we've all been on a used car a lot at some point in our life. And we don't like, we feel sticky and disgusting and, and yucky walking away from that you know, process. And we don't want to be seen as a dirty, rotten salesman. But the reality is, and I tell this to people all the time, like as long as you're charging or you are, um, you're offering people, you're not forcing them obviously, but you're offering them an option to work with you or to um, have you present or bring your solution to bear on their situation. And that person sees it as valuable because value is entirely subjective. And there, you know, we've had patients that don't want to pay $5 for therapy. And then exactly. we have patients that'll pay 150 bucks a visit exactly. um, because value is subjective and there's a spectrum there. So as long as you're giving people the, the option mm -hmm. and the, the possibility of having you bring your solution to bear on their situation and they find value in it, like that is a free transaction that is not in any way coerced and it should be encouraged. <laughs> I love that perspective. I also, to add on to that, what I tell people that are my clients and what I told my team for at Spring OT was we actually need to make money to stay open so that we yeah. can start giving money away. Exactly. Like eventually we had a certain number of spots every quarter, I think, that I actually gave free reign to whomever was answering the telephone like you don't need to come to me if you think after hearing that person's story that they need one of i don't remember how many spots it was let's say four let's say five i don't yeah. remember um you know if you feel that they need a sliding scale or free or whatever i wasn't love with free because free often meant people didn't show up yeah that's the only reason even a dollar means people are going to show up <laughs> um you know and we had like scholarships for people who came to our summer camps we had people traveling like four or five hours away we would find a hotel for them we would set up a corporate account like you know and i gave my team carte blanche to do that but we needed to make money in yeah. order to do that so don't start out as a charity like become profitable learn how exactly what you're saying there were many many times rafi people would say well i'm definitely coming and i'd say okay but you actually live like 40 minutes away and there's an amazing therapist that i know that would be really helpful that's 10 minutes from where you live like we referred people all the time yeah sometimes they'd say no 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 no. it doesn't matter we're still coming to you and other times they would say great I, in fact one of the lines i used to say because again socialized medicine is if i i'm here to try to help you find some free money first so for example if your child is two and a half and under they can qualify to have a free screen or a free assessment rather. However, the wait list was also two and a half years. Yeah, forever long. long yeah. So, you know, again, it's all about options. And at the end of the day, what I say is sales is a conversation. I mean, I sold a, a closed clinic yeah. <laughs> through a conversation, conversation yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Cool deal. Well, now after that sidebar, um, where are we at? Okay, developing that mission, vision, values. How does that impact business process? We've been talking a little bit about it. It's kind of come out in the conversation. You gave your mm -hmm. you gave your people carte blanche to you know do a sliding scale or something mm -hmm. like that. Obviously, that's an implication of the values and the mission and the vision mm -hmm. you know, coming out in the business process. But how does the the mission and the vision translate to I don't know patient intake or, or you know name a name a process? How do you develop a process based off of that 
work that you did before the mission and the vision? I think the word that I keep circling back to is profitability. How does it affect profitability? And there are many ways. I categorize them as internal and external. So internally is your people. Externally is your customers. So let's talk internal for a second. I recently had an exit interview with the person who was doing my social media for Trish Williams Consulting. Her name is Lisa Westhorpe. She's an OT entrepreneur herself. She's amazing. Go follow her stuff. Nurture OT, I believe, is what she's under. So we had an exit interview because she no longer wanted to do this job. It's not that she was unhappy. It's not that like I wasn't paying her well. It was I actually want to spend more time with my children and on my own business. Great. We can't compete with that. What I didn't know until the exit interview was the reason she worked for me was because of the vision and the mission. Oh, wow. Yeah. I had no idea. And we'd been working together for at least a year. So that is an example of how missions and visions and values can affect your profitability internally. Lisa was a revenue generator in my company because social media, it's not our main revenue generator, but social media was one of the ways that we got clients. Yeah. So that's how that works from an internal perspective. From an external perspective, I think it's a bigger conversation about your customers in terms of marketing, how you market to them, and how do you serve them. Really briefly on marketing, most people take two approaches, take take a, a relatively cookie cutter approach to marketing, and it's not wrong, but it's kind of like you're doing one of two things. You are trying to solve a pain point, show that you're trying to show the customer the pain point of theirs that you solve, or you're trying to like, you know, lift them up and encourage them through pleasure. So let's take exercise. Let's pretend I owned a gym. It would be, you know, you feel gross, your pants don't fit. (laughs) Blah, right? Stepping on the scale is like painful and you probably are close to being pre-diabetic and you can't walk up a flight of stairs without huffing and puffing. That would be the pain. The pleasure is you feel amazing. You look great in a mirror. You get to be friends with all these other people at the gym, right? Like, so there's two ways of marketing that. And that's pretty traditional. Using, leaning in to the mission and values. Sorry, I said that wrong. The mission and the vision. See, even I get confused at times. Is a more modern way of marketing. And I've seen it. And again, I'm not going to split hairs, but it's called causal marketing or movement marketing. Have you heard of these before? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it or you want me to? No, keep on going. Okay. So it really is people uniting around your cause. (laughs) And this collective feeling of we're all in this together. So I can tell you, I'll use my business as an example. And a lot of people call with a whole ton of pain points, right? The most, the one I hear the most is, I don't know how to do this without working a hundred hours a week and I'm still not making enough money. That's the one I hear the most when people call me for consulting and coaching. That would be more of a traditional, like, let me help you solve that pain point. Let me lean into, let's get you more time. And the pleasure is like, at the end of the day, you can feel like the valuable CEO that you are, right? The movement causal marketing is, I know you can do more with the money you want and it'll have a killer impact on you. And so, again, we talked about this, like, which is going to get the hell yes? Am I allowed to sound yeah, yeah, curse sure. on your podcast? Okay. <laughs> I don't even consider that a curse at this point. Okay, moving on. Um, You know, and that greater mission and vision can really help attract a client in a really valuable way. Um, 
one of the first times, the first example I ever heard of this was Ben and Jerry's. Do you, what comes up when I say Ben and Jerry's to you in terms of their social agenda? Oh, I don't know. I don't eat a lot of ice cream. Oh, (laughs) okay. I'm also older than you. So it's probably like, you know, more of a forefront because they're an older company. They were, I remember going to Vermont. I used to live in Boston and we toured Ben and Jerry's in Vermont and they were one of the very first companies to really lean in to green, to lean into the environment that every, for every pint we sell, we're donating this much money back to the environment. I just did a podcast last week on the owner of Patagonia. Did you hear about that? What yeah, you, what I did. They did? That's yeah. huge. So the owner of Patagonia gave away their $3 billion company and every single piece of profit is now going towards the environment. So you can have environmental causes, social causes, governance cause, causes. You can, you know, you can lean into what's meaningful, but it really, it, it creates a more sustainable long-term company because people grow alongside you yeah yeah it's kind of the idea i don't know if you've read oh what's his name schaefer is his last name he wrote a book called marketing rebellion no several years ago but it's yeah it's very similar to that idea of instead of following this process of like now i you know, I'm a big fan of copywriting and Dan Kennedy and that's all wonderful. Mm -hmm. But instead of like leaning into that as your soul, like the high level strategy of your, of your marketing, Mm -hmm. you do tap into this, the, the tribe, if you would, of people that are, are in alignment with your values. It's going to resonate with what you have to say. And then you Mm -hmm. leverage that to grow your business. So the idea of, you know, user generated content and all that kind of stuff kind of plays into it, but it starts with, who are my people? Mm-hmm. Um, what what kind of values do they have that align with mine? And are they going to, to resonate with this message or this service mm-hmm. offering, even when you're talking mm-hmm. about developing the service offerings of your business? Well, and you know, it also, it does a few other things. Like inherently, although people might not know they're thinking this, they might not have the words around it. Again, to illustrate my mission and vision because it's the one I'm most familiar with and the one I talk to clients about the most, you know, I think they would also expect a certain amount from me as the CEO of this company. So they're probably going to assume that I pay my people well, because that would be in misalignment. (laughs) Right. And they want, they want people like everybody wants to have people paid well. Right. Um, another thing is they would recognize that I would place a value on the results that they are getting. So if I'm asking and leaning into, we need more money in the pockets of more female OTs, I'm gonna follow up with that by consistently checking in with my clients and making sure. (laughs) They're making more money, yeah. Exactly, right? So there is an alignment of not just the marketing or your team, but how you're running your business. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm a big fan of talking about that, especially with the clients that I work with. Like if your mission is X, whatever it is, like your internal business processes need to reflect that because patients or clients are going to see that. (laughs) They're going to see that you're talking about, you know, humanizing healthcare, for example, and then they come into your clinic and you're just all about, (laughs) you know, getting the range of motion measurements and setting some- Or it's a bot that greets them at the door. (laughs) (laughs) A little robot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So- yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. You need to make sure that it's, it's lining up like that. So that's awesome. Um, we're getting here near the top, but I always end with this. I always ask people if there's like one or two main takeaways you'd want somebody to get from this episode, particularly in this case around mission, vision, values, and how that leads to profitability, what would they be? It's not fluff work. Yeah. It's not do this worksheet because your kindergarten teacher told you to do this worksheet. (laughs) Or your business coach told you it's important. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I was trying to think of something that resonates. Like when people are like, why isn't my child playing in the sand? Why are they sitting at a stupid thing doing circles? Like I actually happen to agree with that. You can learn how to do circles again from a pizza tea perspective, right? You can learn how to do circles through messy play rather than sitting there with a chunky crayon at a little table when you're five. Okay. Um, it's not fluff work. It's actually 
meaningful. And so I think that's the biggest takeaway is spend the time. If you need Rafi's help, go get Rafi's help. If you want my help, I've got a strategic plan. I have a whole CEO payday around it. You know, get my help. If you want to just comb a bunch of resources, listen to this podcast. I have a podcast specifically about this, how to build a strategic plan. Like there's freebies out there too, because it means something. It is meaningful to the bottom line. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Trish, thanks so much. Where can people find you? I think you've mentioned the, the website a couple of times, but give yeah. us all the places. Oh, thanks. It's trishwilliamsconsulting.ca, again, Canada. And there was some turkey out there named Trish Williams who decided to be a consultant and grab the dot com. I'm stalking her. <laughs> I'm stalking her. Um, You're waiting for her to go out of business or something so you snatch that domain. <laughs> well, she hasn't done much with it, too. I feel like going knock, 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 knock. And I'm like, eh, maybe that's for another day. Um, uh, you can follow me. Well, and the other actually easiest place is listening to the OTs Get Paid podcast. I do a podcast too. People really resonate. And you can get me on social media in the OTs Get Paid Facebook group. A lot of people DM me through that too. Awesome. Cool deal. Thank you so much, Rafi. Yeah. Thanks so much. Have a good one. You too. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Trish Williams talking about mission, vision, and values and the role they play in both defining and laying the groundwork for business success and profitability, and even the operational decisions you make at your organization. I'm a big fan. Whenever I'm talking to a client or prospective client, you know, we talk a lot of times folks reach out to me and they're like, hey, I need X, Y, Z. I need, we, we need a project done for maybe employee engagement or employee retention, or you know what, our plan is, our plan of care completion rate is really low and we want to look at that, or we just, we're starting, we want to make sure that the business development at this, at this clinic is um, rock solid from the beginning, right? And one of the things that I always look at with all of my clients is kind of the, the intersection of, we've written an article about it, maybe I'll tag it in the, uh, in the show notes, but it's basically aligning trying to align the the clinical specialty or um, skill set, if you would. I'm a big fan of leading with, as Blair Enns from Win Without Pitching, Pitching says, the tip of the spear is your specialism or your specialty. Not saying that that's the only work that you do, but that's what you that's what you drive home, right? That 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 is what sets you apart is this specialty or this focus that you have, especially in healthcare, where there's a lot of different kind of subspecialties. But so you you want to draw a circle basically around your the specialty that you have or the the area of focus that you want to spend a lot of time treating or serving. Next to that, you've got to figure out where that aligns with the market potential. Is there even a market for this specific service or um, service offering or treatment or or whatever it is, program? Is there a market for it? And if it is, how big is it? And then the third leg of that stool, if you would, is how does that fit with the higher purpose or the mission of the organization? And what you're trying to do when you're developing some kind of service offering or maybe uh, expanding, I got called in to, to help a, a client recently that was trying to expand their clinic. And they were looking at a few different potential acquisitions. Um, and I don't do a whole lot of the work on the, the valuation and the, the business side of the, of the of the acquisition, I'm not. I'm not into that. We can refer you to, and there's you, know, Mike uh, Pekatowski, who's been on the show a couple times. He's great. Call him if you want somebody to uh, to do evaluation or walk you through acquisitions. But this this engagement was really about okay. We have a couple different directions in which we could go. They both seem very profitable. They both have a lot of upward potential. Um, which one should we do? And then how do we build a business development plan around it so that once we acquire this practice, we can hit the ground running, right? Or once we acquire this new location, we can hit the ground running and grow and expand it. So we ended up looking at, okay, there were two semi-similar but yet very distinct potentials for growth and expansion. And what we did was we really looked at, okay, how, does, how would it work if you purchased 
clinic A or location A, and how would that impact the marketing, the messaging, the business development that you're going to spin up around that new service offering, that new location? And the same thing with with you know, clinic B or location B or expansion B, whatever you want to call it. And it's very, it's very, very important f- just from a like a a pure resource management perspective, it is much easier, much less costly to develop one business development plan, one high level strategic, whatever you want to call it, a business development plan, a marketing plan, if you would, a- around one specialty. So you, until you get to the point where you have a, a whole lot of money in the bank and a whole lot of cash around, it really maintains a lot of integrity. It keeps things efficient if you're focusing in that one area. Well, the same thing is true with the mission, right? The, maybe the vision of the organization is very grand, like a world without people in pain or whatever, but the mission is very specific, uh, uh, helping people with back pain overcome um, whatever limica- limitations they have or, or you know, something, something along those lines. The marketing and the messaging around for the business development plan around that specialty around that specialism is going to be very tailored to that vision that specific vision so one of the mistakes that you can fall into much like trying to get into varying and and disparate specialties or specialisms or focuses if you would is adding more visions (laughs) to go with all the things that you're adding at the clinic right so from a strategic perspective, we want to keep it all very streamlined, very concentrated, very uh, centered, if you would, on one main vision, because then it's easier to build all of the other things around it. It's be easier to build that marketing plan, to write that copy, to develop service offerings, to even decide which location or locations you're going to open and where and why, if you're focused on, on one singular vision, right? Um, and then I love Trisha's example about what your mission, your vision, your values, and the way you communicate that, what that does to prospective patients or clients as they come to your organization. Because what you have to say, or the stake you've put in the ground around something, in her in her case, you know, profitability and paying people well, like her clients expect her to pay her people well, to treat her people well. Um, and what that means for your organization as you begin developing your marketing, your messaging plan, what that is going, the expectations that that, the way you communicate that mission, that vision, the values, the all of that, the offerings that you develop, what that does to your prospective patients and clients as they come to you, what expectations does it put in their mind and are you able to live up to them? So um, it's definitely one of those one of those areas that kind of gets talked about a lot and there's a lot of information about it, um, but it's so, so important to get it dialed in and focused for your organization just because it makes everything easier. It makes the business development easier. It makes culture and hiring and firing and all of those decisions easier if you're if you're being guided by a common set of values and that's you know, pushing you towards or, or driving you towards this grander, bigger vision. So anyways, all I've got on that. All righty. Um, if you like the show, head on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review. If you want to get notified when we drop new episodes, we do that every other week. Uh, maybe there's a bonus episode in between, but most of the time it's every other week on Wednesdays. You can head on over to betteroutcomes.show or www.rehabupracticesolutions. Click on the link for insights and there's a, a page there for the podcast and you can sign up there. And we'll shoot you an email with the show notes and all the places that you can find our guests and, and all of that. And if you are a, an healthcare administrator, manager, um, organizer, <laughs> or um, an owner or, or an executive at a, at a healthcare practice, and you're looking to develop a system that not only delivers great patient experiences and outcomes, but also let what I like to say returns the focus of healthcare to where it should be, which is the people, the people receiving the care and the people uh, delivering that care, your staff, your employees, your clinicians, um, reach out to me. Uh, we've got links on the on the website <laughs> for where you can schedule a time to chat. Um, October's 
booked up. I think I've got a few uh, slots available maybe that last week in October, but let's have a conversation, see how I can help. And um, I'm starting to spin up the, uh, the speaking engagements again now that we've got the book out. So the book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare is available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, wherever you buy books, I guess, online. Um, through, and through the publisher, uh, Business Experts Press. Um, so I'm getting on the, the speaking train a little bit, doing a few presentations specifically on the idea of humanizing healthcare. And if that's something you want uh, discussed or presented at your organization or your uh, healthcare conference in the upcoming year, um, again, shoot me an email or uh, go to the website, rehabupracticesolutions.com, click the link for speaking and training, and uh, schedule a call. We'll figure something out. All right, folks, until the next time, be safe, be healthy. I will talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Better Outcomes Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Our hope is that you walk away from each episode informed, equipped, and empowered to push the boundaries in your own practice or business. We want to give you the tools to help you build strong, long-lasting relationships with your patients and clients helping meet their goals, improve their health, and achieve better outcomes. Learn more at www.RehabUPracticeSolutions.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.